so how can we maximize the use of what we have naturally on site to make it go further? Um, how many of you have seen me give a talk before? Okay, it's not as many as I thought. Because I, I don't want jokes to get stale. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the other thing I want to focus on is how we can integrate our approach. So by using no more materials, but by being a little wiser on how we connect everything to everything else, we can get more for less. So um, I see we can take one of two paths. We can take the path of scarcity or abundance. And they're very similar. It's just a slight tweaking. So on the path of scarcity, we typically plant on these burial mound-like hills that drain water, topsoil, sediment out of the system, okay? Uh, and we also send our household gray water out of the system. So over time, we're steadily depleting resources. So the resource base uh, gets worse over time, more depleted. We become aware of this, maybe even scared, maybe even scared to be in the city on the path to <coughs> scarcity. First bad joke. Okay, so we can... We can shift things just a little bit. So instead of planting on mounds, we're planting within or beside sunken water harvesting earthworks or rain gardens. So then when it rains, all the rain that falls from the sky is captured. None of it runs off. In addition, we can capture all leaf drop, so all the biomass stays on site. And we recycle the nutrients for a closed nutrient loop, so we don't have to import fertilizers. And we can send our household gray water to these same rain gardens in times of no rain. So the rain garden becomes a gray water harvesting garden uh, in those dry times. Uh, using this approach, our natural resource base can be improved over time. It gets better. Uh, we become aware of this, maybe even happy. So happy you want to take your buns, these things, shake them to do a little bun dance on the path to a bun dance. <laughs> so. Um, Let's uh, look at the Tucson context. Uh, this photograph on the left was taken in 1904 from a mountain looking south. So we were used to be in a much more abundant community in terms of our natural resources. We used to have a river, the Santa Cruz, that flowed year-round. Um, there's the Santa Cruz River flowing. In addition to that, we had abundant springs and artesian wells throughout the basin, such, and neighborhoods were formed around these. Rolling Wells neighborhood formed around artesian wells. Um, and we had uh, wonderful forests of mesquites, cottonwoods, willows, and hackberry trees, um, which was acted as the living sponge. So when the rain fell from the sky, it was more readily absorbed and infiltrated into the watershed than drained away. That has now sh changed because we have replaced the sponge with pavement. Over 30% of Tucson's surface area is paved with uh, concrete, uh, sidewalks, driveways, asphalt, streets, and so on, and buildings. Um, so we, and we have literally hardened the arteries of our waterways, our river, with um, the concrete stabilization. So now when it rains, the bulk of the rain flows out of the system instead of infiltrating. Looking more closely at the watershed, um, I joke that uh, I think we are a hydrophobic society, I think we are afraid of water, because we're doing all we can to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Thereby, literally, whether it's conscious or not, in our infrastructure and our building, we are drying and dehydrating our community. Okay? Um, so commercial development, typically 95 to 100% paved. Uh, residential, building on the high part, that's good, so it's not flooded, but we send roof runoff right past the uh, landscape into the street and the storm drains and the guns of that and shoot the water right out of the system. So when, um, when I start talking about capturing the rain and harvesting it, people often laugh, but there is an abundance where there is a perceived scarcity. So more rain falls on the surface area of Tucson than all of Tucson's consume of municipal water in a typical year of rainfall. Okay? So it, uh, rainfall actually exceeds municipal water consumption by, I think, uh, around 40,000 uh, acre feet of water a year. Um, but let's, let's go back to the change. This is a photograph taken near Martinez Hill, uh, which would be on the left side of the highway when you're going by San Javier. 
looking at the Santa Cruz River. That's the only bit of the river you can see in the 1940s. The rest of your view is blocked out by massive cottonwoods, willows, half bearing mesquite trees. Um, you look at the same vantage point. There's the boulder. There's the saguaro. For only 40 years later, and we lost it. We lost that forest. We lost the sponge. We killed it because not only have we um, changed the, the watershed so now it drains the rain instead of infiltrating it, we're also, unfortunately, over-consuming our local water resources at a rate that far exceeds natural recharge. So the water table has dropped below the roots of all those plants, and we've lost them. So um, while we have the ability to kill water resources, we also have the ability to generate um, water resources or make them linger longer in the year. So this is a small check dam that was built across um, the slope of a bare bedrock drainage way in Pima Canyon. After building this speed hump, it slowed the flow enough to uh, let sediment, seed, and whatnot accumulate behind it like a sand tank. And now, after a big rain event, instead of the rain stop, the instead of the water flowing through here stopping after a matter of, hour, matter of hours, the water here seeping out of this created spring continues to flow for a period of three weeks. It's not that there's any more water; it's just that it now takes longer for the water to move through. Okay. So I think that's pretty juicy, that we can, in the right instances, actually create springs. And all we really do to do that is slow the flow of the resources through the system. Now, how can we do this at home? Looking at a home landscape and very simple passive strategies, we can move away from this landscape on intensive care to this landscape, which thrives without um, excessive inputs. So uh, in this paradigm, Again, we're planting on the burial mounds, draining water and organic matter away. So we have to bring in intravenous-like drip irrigation emitters to replace the vital fluids. We've drained from the dying patient here. And we send the household roof runoff right past the landscape into the storm drain, causing sediment and flooding problems for the municipality. And it's no wonder it's such a paradigm that 30 to 50% of the drinking water consumed by the average residents is used to irrigate the landscape. Okay, that's a huge waste to use drinking water um, to irrigate the landscape. So a better paradigm, I think, is where rainwater is the primary water source, household gray water the secondary, municipal or well water only a supplementary source. Now, um, we can do that here by planting within or beside these sunken water harvesting earthworks or rain gardens instead of planting on mountains. That way in Tucson, where we get 12 inches of rain a year, this landscape will get 36 inches of rain a year. How's that possible? You've got 12 inches falling from the sky. All 12 inches infiltrates the soil. None of it is cast off into the streets. So you get the full 12 inches, whereas this landscape is lucky if it gets 6 inches a year. Then you've got the roof area, which is about the same as the landscape area. All that roof runoff is directed to and within the soil of the landscape, doubling your available rainfall to 24 inches of rain a year. Then you've got your hardscape of sidewalks, driveways, patios. You don't slope them to the street, you slope them to the landscape. So you get that 12 inches of rain falling on that surface area, tripling your available rainfall to 36 inches of rain a year. And thereby making it very easy to reach this paradigm where rainwater is the primary irrigator of our landscape. And I focus on the landscape first because it's the lowest hanging fruit, it's very easy to do, you don't need to buy a lot of things, you're just basically getting a shovel and moving dirt, and selecting the right plants. Um, and it can lead to a 30 to 50 percent water use reduction. Now you can augment this even further by using gray water. It is legal to harvest gray water in Arizona and New Mexico if you follow the state's common sense guidelines. So here you have a sink in the house, pea trap, vent stack, and then you just maintain a quarter inch per foot drop in your pipe right out to a level bottom mulched and vegetated rain garden or gray water garden. The plants become your living filter. They uptake the water so you can use that water in the form of fruit and the trees, shade, and so on. And you periodically flush the system with rainwater. Okay? And you have to be careful what soaps you use. You don't want to use soaps with salt, sodium, boron, or chlorinated bleach to the landscape. 